Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order this hearing of the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Today is March 23rd. And uh, as always, we'll start by taking the roll. Ms. Niederhofer. Evening. Present. Hewitt. Present. Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Ackland. Present. Backer. Backer, present. Bonner. Present. Beerman. Present. Bolden. Present. Damoth. Damoth, present. Freiburg. Present. Grunhagen. Present. Keel. Present. Morrison. Morrison, present. Munson. Munson, present. Pryor. Present. Quam. Present. Quam, present. Ryer. Present. Schultz. Present. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, present. Everyone is here. A quorum is present. Thank you very much, Ms. Dieter Hopper. So, um, quorum being present, the next order of business is uh, moving the minutes from March 21st. Representative Bierman. Madam Chair, I move the minutes from March 21st, please. All right. Thank you, Representative Bierman. So, the minutes from March 21st are before us. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes of March 21st, 2022, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Okay, so um, the original agenda that was sent out uh, needed to be, the order needed to be switched just a bit. So um, Representative Cagle's bill, we will not take up first because she is presenting in another committee. So. We're going to start with House File 3631, Representative Morrison. And um, just so members understand what we're doing here, we are um, taking uh, some bills that we already heard in this committee. These are the scope of practice or licensing bills. And we've received fiscal notes on them. And some of them now we're going to be voting to move them to ways and needs. Um, so, and I misspoke before before the committee, they're going to ways and means, not the floor. So the motion, so uh, Representative Morrison's motion would be to um, take House File 3631 as amended from the table and re-refer it to ways and means. So that is the motion before us. And uh, Representative Morrison, is there anything you'd like to say about the bill? Just to maybe remind the members what the bill is before we take a vote on it. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. And as you mentioned, we have heard 3631. Um, it is a Board of Medical Practice bill that makes some technical changes and uh, brings some of the language up to date. Um, Certainly, I can go into the specifics if you'd like, Madam Chair. Well, uh, Representative Morrison, I don't think that's necessary unless members have questions or want to discuss it at all. Of course, we would entertain any discussion, but unless there is some, I don't think we need to go into the details. Anything from the members? I'm not seeing anything. So, okay. So uh, members then, uh, Representative Morrison is renewing her motion that House File 3631 as previously amended be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And this will be a roll call vote. So um, the chair votes aye. Liebling, aye. Vice Chair Hewitt. Aye. Hewitt, aye. Lead Schumacher. Aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Ackland. Aye. Ackland, aye. Representative Backer. Representative Backer. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Bierman, aye. Representative Bolden. Aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Damoth. Aye. Damoth. Aye. Representative Freiburg. He started at zero dollars and zero stamp. Yes. 
Freiburg, I. So it's, uh, you know, we're. Representative Munson. Thank you. Yep, sorry about that. Representative Grunhagen. Grunhagen, I. Grunhagen, I. Representative Keel. Keel, I. Keel, I. Representative Morrison. Morrison, I. Representative Munson. Munson, I. Representative Pryor. Pryor, I. Pryor, I. Representative Quam. Yes. Quam, I. Representative Ryer. Ryer, I. Ryer, I. Representative Schultz. Schultz, I. Schultz, I. Representative Wolgamott. Wolgamott votes I. Wolgamott, I. And Backer votes I also. Okay, I was just going to check. All right, 19 okay. eyes and zero nays. All right, there being 19 eyes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to ways and means. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Next, we have House File 3854, Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins, are you here with us? I am. There she is, wonderful. So the motion, uh, this is, um, the motion is, the, and the chair will move that House File 3854, as previously amended, be taken from the table and re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And um, Representative Hollins, would you just remind the committee of what the bill is? And we'll see if there's any further discussion before we vote on it. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. This is the bill that would allow. Um, allow pharmacists to prescribe, dispense, and administer drugs for preventing HIV. That is uh, pre-exposure um, prophylaxis and post-exposure, so PEP and PrEP. All right, thank you, Representative Collins. Is there any uh, discussion to the bill? Okay, not seeing any. All right, thank you, Representative Holland. So with that, I will renew my motion that House Bill 3854 as amended be re-referred to Ways and Means. And uh, the chair votes aye. Evelyn, aye. Vice Chair Hewitt. Aye. Hewitt, aye. Lead Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Ackland. Ackland, no. Ackland, no. Representative Backer. Backer, no. Backer, no. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Bierman, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Damuth. Representative Damuth. Damuth, no. Damuth, no. Representative Freiburg. Freiburg vote, yes. Freiburg, aye. Representative Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Representative Keel. Keel, no. Keel, no. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Munson. Munson, no. Munson, no. Representative Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Representative Quam. Is that a no, I think? Representative Kwam, we, we can't hear you. Very little. I don't know. Okay, it's a no. All right, okay, Kwam, no. Representative Breyer. Breyer, aye. Breyer, aye. Representative Schultz. Schultz, I. Schultz, I. Representative Wolgamott. Wolgamott votes I. Wolgamott, I. There are 11 ayes and eight nays. All right, there being 11 ayes and eight nays, the motion prevails and House File 3854 is on its way to Ways and Means. Thank you very much, Representative Hollins. All right, next on the agenda, we have House File 3560. Representative Herr, are you present with us? I am present, uh, Chair. There Lee. she is, welcome. So um, this is another bill that uh, we are 
hoping to move to ways and means, but we also, I believe there's an amendment. So the chair will move that House File 3560 as previously amended be taken from the table and re-referred to ways and means. And then uh, Representative Herr, there is a, an author's amendment, the A2. And I wonder, could you, um, the chair will move the A2. So that is before us. Uh, would you like to explain that before we adopt it? Thank you, Chair Liebling. And the A2 amendment is just, um, it's a small change to correct an error for cost from $115 to $91, and it just puts the bill in its proper form. All right, so any questions on the A2 author's amendment? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the A2 is adopted. And then uh, we also heard this bill previously and um, Representative Herr, could you just uh, remind us briefly about what it does uh, before we move it to Ways and Means? Thank you, Chair Liebling and Committee. This is just again a technical bill. It proposes to align the license by credential process for licensed dental therapists. Minnesota has had dental therapists for over 10 years, and so the board has a license by credential pathway for all other licensed uh, dent, uh, dental professionals. And so they're just um, bringing this in line with what we do for dentists, hygienists, and assistants. Um, this bill also cleans up language as it relates to the fees. It consolidates existing fees into one section for easier understanding. It eliminates fees that do not get charged anymore, and it also streamlines fees to address the like, complaint process. And so it's um, it's actually quite technical, but it is just cleaning up language and making sure that we have a pathway for those coming in from out of state to be able to uh, be a dental therapist. All right. Thank you, Representative Herr. And any discussion from the members or questions? Okay. Seeing none. All right, then. So I will renew my motion that House File 3560, as amended previously and today, uh, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And so we'll take the roll on the bill and the chair votes aye. Liebling, aye. Vice Chair Hewitt. Aye. Hewitt, aye. Lead Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Ackland. Ackland, aye. Ackland, aye. Representative Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Representative Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Bierman, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Damoth. Aye. Damoth, aye. Representative Freiburg. <clears throat> Freiburg votes yes. Freiburg, aye. Representative Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Keel, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Representative Munson. Munson, I. Munson, I. Representative Pryor. Pryor, I. Pryor, I. Representative Quam. Representative Quam. I. Quam, I. Representative Ryer. Ryer, I. Ryer, I. Representative Schultz. Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot votes aye. Wolgamot, aye. There are 19 ayes and zero nays. All right, there being 19 ayes and zero nays, House File 3560 is re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Representative Herr. Okay, uh, next we have House File 3730, Representative Bierman. And uh, this one is not, is not one we previously heard, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Bierman, so I'm not getting things confused here, but um, Representative Bierman's motion would be that House File 3730 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. And uh, Representative Bierman, um, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll slow the whole process down now with a few words and then a testifier, but um, good bill. So appreciate you taking the time and committee members to hear the bill. So um, as members of this committee are well aware, 
Our state is currently experiencing an unprecedented shortage of workers available to provide the critical hands-on disability supports that allow our family members and community members with disabilities to live full and meaningful lives. It is a challenging time in disability services as individuals struggle mightily to find and keep the staff that provide them their needed supports. So at this time of a dire workforce shortage in disability services, our state must do all we can to make it as easy a process as possible for those who do step forward wanting to work in disability services. The bill before you today is aimed at addressing a administrative delay that is exacerbating the workforce shortage. Right now, each individual who begins work as a personal care assistant in Minnesota is required to have a unique member provider identification number, a UMPI. When a PCA is hired by a new agency, their UMPI number must be affiliated with that agency prior to their employer being able to bill for the services they provide. Currently, it can take four weeks or more for a PCA to obtain their UMPI number from DHS provider enrollment and or have it appropriately affiliated with a new agency if they move. As a result, there's a significant lag between an individual being hired and their employer being able to bill for the services they are providing. Some agencies are not able to carry this financial burden and therefore are unable to let the PCA start providing services until they have the UMPI number. In this extremely tight labor market, this delay can result in the loss of a potential employee and one less worker available to help provide the services needed by our community members with disabilities. The legislation before you provides resources for DHS to use to decrease, decrease this processing wait time. We must pursue all approaches to addressing the factors contributing to the shortage of staff willing to enter and remain in disability services, including addressing this on the ground administrative barrier. I ask for your support of this bill and will now turn to the testifier for further testimony in support of the bill. Madam Chair, I would appreciate the committee hearing from Ms. Pang Vang, and then we could go to any member questions. All right, thank you, Representative Bierman. Pang Vang, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, members of the committee, my name is Pang Vang. I'm the treasurer of the Minnesota First Provider Alliance, a statewide membership association for personal care assistant providers. I run a minority owned PCA agency, Rainbow Healthcare, located in the Twin Cities for the past 19 years. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 3730. This bill is being brought forward by the Minnesota First Provider Alliance and the Minnesota Home Care Association. The bill proposes investments in current existing DHS technology to shorten an administrative wait time for new personal care assistants, a wait time that is currently exacerbating the already incredibly challenging workforce shortage. I do want not want to repeat the wonderful talking points of Representative Bierman. I just want to briefly share with the committee my agency's experience with this current DHS processing delay and the challenges to provide Minnesotans with the care they need to remain living as independently as possible. My agency does not allow the PCA to start working until we get the UMPI number for many reasons. A lot of my PCAs are Hmong and have similar first and last names or have no middle names. And we will often get a request for additional information from provider enrollment, which causes a, another 30 day delay and restarts the processing time. If a PCA makes an error on the UMPI application, which does happen often because most of my PCAs are BIPOC, then the PCA needs to make corrections to the application before we can resubmit. Any corrections will start another 30-day processing time frame and delay. And if the client is under an MCO, we must request another PCA identification number from the MCO, which is different from the DHS issue UMPI number. And that can take up to 160 days to get. We financially cannot carry a PCA for what could be as long as six months and not get fully reimbursed for what we already paid out in wages. And I would like to thank the members of this committee for your interest in trying to speed up this process to help address the current crisis level shortage of personal care assistance available to provide the direct support critical for older Minnesotans and those with disabilities to live in the community. 
All right, thank you very much, Ms. Vang. Um, are there questions from members? Right. I'm not seeing any. I have a question for Ms. Vang, just based on what you just told us. So if the client is under an MCO and they're not in, enrolled and you have to, are you not able to collect back payments for service that was given while we, they were waiting enrollment? Ms. Vang? Yes. Uh, yes, we are. We're able to uh, back uh, collect that back pay. It's just that um, you have to have the funds available for that five or six months sometimes to be able to pay all of those wages. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments from members? All right, I'm not seeing any. So final word, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to thank my testifier, Ms. Peng Vang, for all of her work in this area. And uh, just thank the committee for considering this uh, bill. This isn't going to solve the problem, but it will certainly help. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Beerman. Thank you, Ms. Vang. So House File 3730 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. OK, uh, next is Representative Ryer with House File 4478. So the. Um, the motion here, Representative Ryer's motion would be that House File 4478 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. So you have the floor, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Today I'm bringing forward House File 4478, a bill that sets requirements for ongoing rebasing of dental reimbursement rates. As you may recall, dental rates for medical assistance in Minnesota care have been based to 1989 actuals for many years, and this bill addresses that. It requires that beginning January 1st, 2023, and every three years thereafter, dental payment rates for medical assistance in Minnesota care must be rebased. And to explain the details of this rebasing, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Jogo Hayes from the Department of Human Services. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Ryer. Uh, Mr. Hayes, welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Chiyoko Hayes with the Department of Human Services. <clears throat> As Representative Ryer mentioned, um, <clears throat> dental uh, rates in Minnesota are based on 1980 char 1989 charges. And so as the over the years, as the legislature has um, enacted rate increases, we've always just added those rate increases based on um, cost information that was submitted to the department in 1989. But one can imagine that the cost of, of, uh, of staff, the cost of technology, the cost of doing business has certainly changed since 1989. And so the purpose of this uh, particular exercise is to try to base the rates on a more recent cost estimate from providers based on the charges that they submit on their claims. So we would do that um, per the language with the aggregate funding that's already appropriated by the legislature with a small inflationary increase. Uh, and reset the rates to more accurately reflect the cost of doing business today. So if uh, a dentist does a pro fee, the payment would be more reflective of how much staff time and resources it takes to do that, or if they do an x-ray, similarly situated. Um, I will mention two, two, two quick things. Also, uh, this particular language is the result of a request from the legislature last year to do a legislative report on this topic. It was discussed uh, with our dental home partners in the um, dental home work group, as well as approved and voted on by the Dental Services Advisory Committee. The concept of rebasing is, is generally widely supported by the dental community, uh, and this language was reviewed and approved by those folks as well. And then the last thing I'll mention is that the, the inflationary factor is an important piece to, to the proposal in order to ensure that we don't end up with dental rates like we have uh, most recently had two years ago, where we set the rates, don't tweak them for several years, and we sort of lose ground uh, on the efforts to increase dental rates. So the inflationary factor allows us to continue to modify the rates and keep up with inflation and not lose ground in that space. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Are there questions for members? Okay, Representative Bierman. Oh, and we can't hear you. Thank you. I do have a, a question for the testifier, Mr. Rice. Um, regarding the rebasing and the calculation, is there a certain number of price quotes that you seek out to get rebase that in a specific for a specific um, practice or procedure? 
and then also is that rebasing done regionally in Minnesota or is it one price for everyone? Mr. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Bierman, we pull all the dental claims that are submitted uh, in fee for service and look at the um, charge that each provider submitted. So there's hundreds and thousands of charges for each individual dental code. And then we'll figure out based from there what percentile of charges uh, we would set the rate at. And again, that percentile of charges in aggregate multiplied by the number of times each code is submitted will equal the same spend that the legislature um, has appropriated today plus in inflation. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. That's very helpful. I really appreciate knowing that. And uh, I also wanted to just um, speak favorably on the bill and appreciate uh, Representative Ryer's work in this area and getting to, to, to this issue, which you know affects costs for the providers and um, keeping us up to date in Minnesota. So nice work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Bierman. And I have a couple of questions if other members don't, or maybe this will prompt some from other members. So first of all, Mr. Hayes, you mentioned basing this on fee for service. What happens with MCO payments under this bill? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we use the fee for service data to set the rate. But then, as you may recall, the legislature's uh, passed last year language that requires that all managed care organizations pay at a minimum the DHS rate. And so that will continue. So the new rate will be the new rate, and then the managed care organizations would follow suit. Again, but that's a minimum, so they could pay higher if they wanted to. Okay. And then, uh, and then the capitated rate, I assume, would uh, go up uh, based on that increase. Uh, Madam Chair, we would certainly do the analysis at the end of the session to, to verify that. That being said, the goal here is to maintain an aggregate spend that's the same as today. And so the, the money fluctuates between decode. So a profi might get more money and next rate less or what, you know, just as a tangible example, but the aggregate spend stays about the same. So we'll, we'll, we'll do an analysis to ensure that that's accurate in managed care, but it's likely to stay close to the same. Okay. And then uh, another question that I have is um, about the, the cost information. You mentioned that this was originally determined in 1989 based on a, some kind of analysis of cost. And um, when I looked at the bill, remind me if I'm, I'm not looking at it right now. So if I've got it wrong, please just remind me. But it, um, it has this inflation factor in it. In it. Um, and the, the only thing in it that I really understood as rebasing is it's kind of rebasing it to now, to what we're paying now. And then, but um, no cost analysis has been done since 1989, to my understanding. Is that, is that right? And I guess the question that I would have is, I, I guess I understood as part of rebasing, we were going to do some kind of cost analysis. And I'm not seeing that that's happening. Could you just comment on that? Yeah, Madam Chair, the current dental methodology is based on charges submitted by the provider, right? So they say it costs $17 to do something, that's their charge. The current methodology today says that we have paid a 50th percentile, which means we take all the charges, let's say there's 100 of them, we line them up lowest to highest, and we take the one in the middle. That's the 50th percentile. The exercise here would be similar, but we don't know what percentile we're going to take because we haven't done the math yet. But we'll take all of the charges per code, and we will figure out which, if, just as a tangible example, we might land on 25th percentile of 2020 charges, just as an example. And that would be then the new rate. So it's based on the, the charges they submit on their uh, on each claim that they submit to the department. OK. Uh, yeah, uh, all right. Well, you know, in some areas, we do base, we do actually do a cost survey, not a charges survey, but a cost survey, and base things on that. And I see that that's not what's happening here. So, you know, obviously, that would be a different bill, but just, you know, just saying, that's not what we're doing here. And I, you know, obviously, nobody's getting rich giving dental care to MA patients. We do know that much. So, Anyway, uh, any questions from other members or, or any other discussion? All right, final word, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the um, explanation, um, Mr. Hayes, and also the questions to clarify. 
appreciate your hearing, having it heard. All right, thank you very much, Representative Ryer. So with that, House File 4478 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. Next one, Representative Ryer, House File 4472. And uh, this one again is, um, Representative Ryer is moving that House File 4472 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill to this one, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. We're here today to talk about House File 4472. This is a bill that requires the Commissioner of Human Services to establish a dental home pilot program. This builds on legislation I introduced last March, House File 1918, which required the Dental Services Advisory Committee to collaborate with a wide range of stakeholders to develop recommendations for a dental home pilot. This group was known as the Dental Home Advisory Committee or DHAC. Just to refresh everyone's memory, dental homes are a care delivery model based on partnerships among clinical specialists, families, and community resources. They are not necessarily buildings or places. They extend beyond the walls of a clinical practice and provide care to populations using innovative workforce models in community settings such as schools, shelters, group homes, and other congregate living spaces. This approach lends itself to culturally specific care and helps address disparities in health outcomes. DHAC delivered its report earlier this year. The report identified core components of a dental home, discussed how progress towards achieving these components could be assessed, and defined a list of measures associated with dental home components. The goal is to ensure high quality, patient-centered, comprehensive, and coordinated oral health services for our medical assistants and Minnesota Care members. We now come to the next stage, implementing the pilot. House File 4472 before us here today defines the pilot in detail using the recommendation from DHAC's report. At a high level, this bill requires that an RFP be developed to select participants for the pilot, that participants be chosen, and the pilot implemented by July 1st, 2023. Baseline measurement will occur during this phase and grants will be provided as appropriate to support the dental home activities. Pilot participants will be carefully chosen. By statute, diversity is required in terms of geographic distribution, provider size, type, and location, providers serving different priority populations, health equity issues, and provider accessibility for patients with varying levels and types of disability. The pilot is scheduled to last through fiscal year 2028 with annual reports required. The fiscal note has been requested. In closing, I want to thank all of the members of the Dental Home Advisory Committee for your hard work. My thanks too to testifiers and members of the public who provided their input, input to ensure that this important work was done in the spirit of inclusion and by tapping into the community's shared wisdom. There are truly too many people to name, but you are all appreciated. Next, I'd like to invite our testifier, Dr. Michael Helgeson from Apple Tree Dental to share his perspectives about dental homes. And I'm happy to all take right. any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Ryer. Uh, welcome, Dr. Helgeson. And we can't hear you. I guess I have to unmute. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry for that. So uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Michael Helgeson, uh, the CEO of Apple Tree Dental, a nonprofit organization, which is one of Minnesota's largest critical access dental providers. Last year, our teams delivered more than 95,000 dental visits to residents of 85 of the 87 counties in Minnesota. We're best known for our mobile program and advanced special care services for children, adults, and seniors, and our collaborations with hospitals, including Hennepin Health, Gillette Children's, St. Gabriel's, Medelia Hospital, and most recently, the Mayo Clinic Health System in Fairmont. I'm also an active member of the Get to Yes group and very grateful to key legislators, DHS, and other stakeholders for the groundbreaking legislation that passed last year. With bipartisan support, specific goals for improving access to care for public program patients in rural and urban communities were established. 
but to accomplish these goals, we must test our best ideas as proposed in House File 4472. The pilot project will link stakeholders together in new ways, integrating oral health services with medical and behavioral health homes. It will also efficiently connect small and large dental providers with dental specialists. We've got exciting new innovations to pilot test here in Minnesota. New technologies such as teledentistry, silver diamine fluoride, and promising workforce models, including collaborative dental hygiene practice and dental therapy, have the potential to provide better care at lower costs. We can't continue to do the same things and expect new results. So I urge you to chart a new path by investing in Minnesota's innovators and passing House File 4472. I welcome your questions. Thanks again for the opportunity to testify today. All right, thank you, Dr. Helgeson. Are there any questions for members? I'm not seeing any. Okay. All right, well, um, any final word, Representative Ryer? Um, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just appreciate the support. Okay, with that then, uh, House File 4472 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. Uh, next we have uh, Representative Cagle, and it, she is bringing us House File 3513. And there she is. Welcome, Representative Cagle. And since so she's not on the committee, the chair will move that House File 3513, the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. And Representative Cagle has a, an A3 author's amendment. Is that correct, Representative Cagle? Correct, Madam Chair. And did you want to adopt that one before discussing the bill? Um, yes, please. Okay, so um, the A3 author's amendment is before us. Um, all in favor of adoption of the A3 author's amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So Representative Cagle to you, Bill, as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, House File 3513 is a child care or is a premium assistance for child care employees. So um, this bill creates a, pr a premium assistance program for workers at child care facilities. And I kind of come to this through a um, workforce lens, I guess, being on the workforce committee for the past two um, bienniums. Um, I see this as a, as a way to help support our workers in our child care centers. Um, what it would do is it, it would, um, in order to qualify for the um, premium assistance, somebody would have to work at a child care facility, have a projected taxable household income less than 300% of federal poverty. Um, they would apply for federal and state advanced premium tax credits, um, any all of which they would, any you know, any of which they would be eligible for. Um, they would also have to be eligible for minimum essential coverage that is affordable and provides minimum or be ineligible for those and um, not be eligible for Minnesota care or MA, um, be a Minnesota resident and enroll in a silver level or gold level coverage plan. And so this really directs Minsure to um, kind of establish that program and then provide um, premium subsidies for child care workers who really follow what we're talking about is a small sub subset of workers who fall between the um, Minnesota care and 300% um, of federal poverty. And so with that, I will um, just turn it over to my testifiers. All right, thank you, Representative Cagle. So uh, first on my list, I have Becky Wytashek, if I'm saying that properly, and welcome to the committee and please state your name and uh, who you represent, if anyone, and go ahead and give us your testimony. Thank you. My name is Becky Waitashik. I am part owner of Love and Learn Child Care Academy, um, owner and director. So child care teachers, we really need to have health insurance for them. Um, in order to retain our teachers, um, we need to offer them some kind of benefits. Right now, they're getting nothing. As a profession, we are losing the, our teachers to other positions because we're not offering anything. We can't afford it. So our teachers are looking to other opportunities that are offering them 
what we cannot. Teachers need to take care of their own health in order for them to take care of our children. How can we keep them healthy if they can't afford to take themselves to the doctor, can't afford the health insurance? As child care provider, they cannot afford to take the time off of work because they can't afford a day off because they don't get paid enough. Yet, they can't afford to come in sick either, and they can't afford to go to the doctor because they don't make enough. So having health insurance would really benefit our teachers, and that is all the way across the board. Um, small businesses like myself, we cannot afford to offer the health insurance because of the high cost of it. Parents cannot afford to pay more in child care ready. Um, we looked into it, and in order for one of our teachers to pay for insurance, if we offered it, it would cost them about $1,000 a month. They don't even make that. So how can they afford, how can we afford to offer it to them? We can't afford to pay for it, and the teachers themselves wouldn't be able to afford it either. Our teachers only make $15 an hour. They need to have college credits or a degree. They're living at poverty level already. So health benefits would really definitely help them out. Um, as a child care, we can only pay out what we take in. You know, it's pretty plain and simple in the child care field. Um, there's nobody else subsidizing us. What we charge, that's what we get. And that's what goes out in our teacher salaries. Um, in order for businesses to hire new employees, we need to be able to offer quality child care and have, quali have quality child care settings available to, to these parents. And in order to have that, we need to have quality teachers. Without the teachers, who's gonna provide care to the parents when they need to go to work? Healthcare would definitely help pull in teachers into this profession. We do need to be able to offer child care teachers benefits. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to take and testify. If anybody has any questions, I'm open. All right, well, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, I have Carla Skaponsky. There you go. That's a good way to you hit it all. Well, Great. well please you. repeat your name for us, if you would, and tell us who you're with and go ahead and uh, with My your last testimony. name is Skapansky. Kind of exactly how it's spelled, as it's spelled there, my dear. Huh. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, giving attention to our child care providers. They truly are the backbone of our working community. I know because I've been there. Let me introduce myself. My name is Carla Skapansky. I was a child care provider for, oh, about 15 years. With, and at that time, I raised my, my four children in our child care. In our situation, my husband and mine, he was a farming individual, so he paid the health care premium and I carried all the other expenses. And like the other testifier said, everything that goes in goes back out again. After running for state office, I assisted in directing a center in St. Cloud, holding several teacher positions, of which I made about fourteen and a half dollars an hour. Hearing that attraction to this possession, uh, profession was failing with the starting wage of less than that $15 an hour, not to compete, but McDonald's was paying that also. This means I may never be seeing a day to retire because at $14.5 an hour, I couldn't do it. So currently I teach at the St. Cloud Technical College on the develop DHS platform as an American Heart Association instructor. And I also teach throughout all of greater Minnesota in all areas of DHS. We are a close-knit early childhood community. In these classrooms, educators share the, the retention issues and how those that forego the low income really have a difficult time holding on. That was me. I truly fear, and my major concern is the instability with caregivers on our little learners' mental health because of these issues, not having a consistent caregiver. This is why I need to be there for many of the providers and center directors to continue my support with weekly mandated classes, keeping their teams certified as I enjoy the idea and they and I enjoy the idea that I have walked in their shoes. As an instructor, you can imagine how I try to diffuse these stressors providers have in my class safe space. They struggle with trying to continue for many reasons, but truly the bottom line is the financial stability trying to keep themselves healthy with a very expensive health care. Providers are expected by parents and employers 
to be available Monday through Friday, all day, and many parents do not have a backup plan. Yet, the pandemic, many mental health issues, and now the teacher strikes without child care providers, well, you all see what's happening. Thank you so much for giving me the time to take my couple minutes off from delivering my mail to come speak with you today. Um, I walked in their shoes and I'm gonna probably be doing this the rest of my life because I won't be able to afford to retire. But thank you so much and I gotta get back to my mail. Have a good thank day. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next we have Charla Atar Saheli. Welcome. Please uh, state your name for the record and who you represent and go ahead and give us your testimony. I'm Sharla Atar Saheli. I'm the other owner of Level Learn Child Care Academy. And because health insurance is out of the reach of child care providers, it makes it difficult a profession for people who, that want to go into to the profession. And child care is the foundation of our workforce. Without child care, parents can't go to work. They need to retain, we need to retain teachers and, and provide them the benefits of child care, of health insurance. Health benefits will help teachers and providers stay healthy and be able to care for children. By offering benefits, it will attract more people to the profession and more people will look into child care as being a job, not just a babysitter. Teachers and providers are dealing on a daily basis uh, unhealthy kids. You know, kids come to school unhealthy. Teachers take care of them. Teachers teachers get sick, but teachers aren't allowed to stay home because they have no they have no health insurance to go to the doctors and we take care. But yet every day these teachers show up every day to help take care of children and do their job. And child care has changed over the years. Child care used to be treated as babysitter, now it is a profession. Providers and teachers are qualified. They have college degrees, some two, some four. And so, and they're teaching. So we should be looked more at, more into a profession, not just, oh, I'm sending my child over to somebody to just watch them. So we need to offer our teachers health care so they can take care of our most prized possession, our children. Ask yourself, what would happen if we had no, no more child care? If all these women and men decide, I can't afford it anymore, I need to stay home, then what's gonna happen to the workforce? I used to do in-home child care for 20 years before Becky and I opened Love and Learn. In my in-home, my husband had a job, so I was on his health insurance, that was no problem. I opened the center, both my husband and I both work here at the center, so we're both self-employed. And we're both over 60 years old and cannot get afford health insurance because we do not make enough even as owners. And so we, we feel for our teachers. We try to do everything we can to help them and give them all the money we can, but unfortunately healthcare is out of our reach. So please think about it, what would happen to your children if there was nobody out there to watch them, qualified people. Thank you for letting me testify and have a great day. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I think we could go to member discussion. Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Cagle, for bringing this forward. Um, I'm not seeing a fiscal note unless I missed it, but a question, Madam Chair, for the bill author, if I may. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Representative Cagle, who is actually making the payments or where is the money for this idea and this program going to be coming from? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Damuth. I think that would um, be the HHS target, maybe. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, that's the question. And we are waiting on a fiscal note, and that was exactly why we had to adopt the amendment. Um, I know Ms. Burke is on here from Minsure, but we've been working with Minsure to try and get the um, fiscal note. Um, some of the other, Washington State actually has a plan similar to this, but they don't have a basic qualified health plan, so the Minnesota Care piece. Um, and in their um, premium subsidy assistance program, um, they're projected to have just a little over 400 people enrolled in that plan. 
So um, because we also have Minnesota Care, I, I'm thinking that our numbers might be a little bit lower, um, but we are waiting for that fiscal note. So hopefully soon. Right, and the bill is being laid over, Representative Damon, so we're not moving it without the fiscal note. Uh, did you have a follow-up? I do have a follow-up, um, or maybe just a point. You know, we know that child care shortage has impacted all of us. Um, I have talked for the last few years pre-COVID about the impact on the employers in my district. Um, people are dropping out of the workforce because they can't find adequate child care. And I definitely recognize that both within my own family and within my constituents across the state also. So I think it's a very important thing that we address both from the child care itself, the education piece, and then for the workforce. So I, I agree with that. A concern though that I have that's come up is um, we identify the issue in the shortage of child care, but yet some of those things that we have put into place are not even taking place yet. For example, our family child care ombudsperson that was uh, approved and waiting for that person to be um, named, um, that was back in our special session in June. And so when I look at the bill and I see that there's gonna be a navigator for the child care facilities to access this, I know that ombudsperson and navigator are, are different. I understand that. But that is one of my concerns. Here we have made, we passed legislation. We are waiting for an appointment to that position. And we still, as of today, to the best of my knowledge, have not put that in place. Um, I think that's an important thing to definitely to keep in mind. Um, we know there's a shortage too. So we appropriated $22.5 million in June to DHS to set up child care revitalization grants. So those providers that want to work, they want to take in kids, could revitalize their space. To the best of my knowledge, and I asked the question again earlier this week, those applications haven't even started. So uh, what I'm thinking, Madam Chair, is as we make these efforts across the legislature to stand up that industry and to stand up our child care providers, I think we have to look at what we already have in place that we're still waiting to get out to the public, and that is going to help start meeting our need. But thank you again for letting me um, raise the question. All right. Thank you, Representative Damoth. Representative Cagle, any response? Before we move thank, on. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Damuth. And I think one of the things is this is just another little piece of that puzzle. Um, and you know, we we know the margins are very thin in childcare, and so uh, you know, we just we need to do something to make sure that um, the the people who are wiping our kids' noses and behinds are um, you know have. <laughs> Sorry, my kid just went through potty training, so we're still going through that. Right? But um, you know that that they're taken care of, and um, you know I wish that they could just have a raise, get a raise, and be able to afford um, healthcare, or that you know the the employers were making more money, so that it could be a benefit that they could offer their employees. But that's not the case, and they can't charge more. Um, you know, I already pay a thousand dollars a month for my childcare, and um, and from what I hear, that's a fairly inexpensive um, center. And so um, these are thin, thin margins. Um, they can't really raise their prices. And if they do, they're pricing people out of, out of the market. And so this is just one tiny piece of that puzzle, I think, um, that we can use to support the workforce that supports our workforce. All right. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh... Representative Cagle, it's great to hear this bill again. <laughs> um, so I am a, a big supporter and um, just want to repeat some of the points that uh, Representative Cagle has made, which is this is a piece of the puzzle. And um, as Representative Damoth, who's also on our Early Childhood Committee, has said, you know, there's other things that we were launching and working on. But I think this is something that we're hearing for the first time um, in this session that really is going to make a difference. And you know, I'd ask our committee members here, could you imagine taking this job if we did not have the benefit of healthcare? Do we get paid enough that we could afford to buy insurance right now? I, you know, I, it's, it's something that we should think about. You know, maybe we have a spouse that gives us healthcare and we wouldn't have to worry about it. But if we were a person trying to support a family, you know, would we be able to take this job if we didn't have healthcare? And that's the situation that our healthcare uh, our child care providers are in, they are essential. 
um, to our future because they're taking care of the youngest Minnesotans in the most um, critical times of their developments, of their brain development. Um, and they are, they're, um, they're, they're doing a job that parents need, if parents are gonna go to work, we have to have childcare providers to be there to take care of those kids. So it's, it's essential to our economy. It's essential to um, the education of our children. And the piece, one of the pieces that is missing, you know, in addition to the low wages, is not being able to have benefits, a benefit like healthcare. So I think that this is a, a good fix for what, what a crisis we have right now. Um, and I think it's something that this, this committee, once we find out what that fiscal note is, I think it's something that we should take a serious look at um, because this is gonna matter to Minnesota's economy and it's gonna matter to Minnesota's uh, future if those kids aren't getting that good care that they need in a childcare setting from qualified teachers that, that can afford to do the jobs that they're doing. So thank you, Representative Cagle. Right. Thank you, Representative Pryor. Are there any other comments or uh, questions from members? Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't quite know where to begin. I had some other questions, but the conversation just expanded the whole issue so much that um, I think it all does come back as Representative Pryor talked about it. It matters. You know, the fact that it matters where you work defining what kind of health care you get in our economy is just such a fundamental block to so many people in so many professions. And I think that, you know, you can talk about workforce, but workforce is related to child care. Child care is related to education. Education is related to health care. Everything comes back to that affordability of health care. And so, you know, until we as a body want to address this issue of the high cost of health care that we pay in this country for what we're getting, um, we're going to have all of these other issues that are unresolved. So more, mostly a commentary and um, just nice to be able to say it though. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Okay. Well, um, thank you, members. It's a, it's a good discussion to have here in the health committee to talk about who gets health care, who gets health insurance, and who does not. And I really appreciate this bill, Representative Cagle, um, because anybody who has been around child care knows that taking care of young kids all day is not an easy gig. And if we want to have good people, and there are wonderful, wonderful people out there taking care of our kids, and they're all our kids, you know, we're all invested as Minnesotans in making sure that every one of them gets the best possible start in life, right? I mean, this is something that should unite every one of us, even if we have different ideas about what that would be, what that would look like. But when they're in childcare, uh, away from their families, we want them to have the best, most talented, most dedicated, most loving, most skillful people we possibly can. And yet those people get very low pay and no health insurance often. And it is just appalling to think that doing this super important work that you have to do it at great personal sacrifice. And I just uh, would absolutely love to see us be able to make this a uh, profession that is um, that pays and provides benefits equal to its importance. No question about it. And I know that a lot of the members here join me in that. So thank you very much for bringing this bill. Representative Cagle, thank you for all for the great discussion. And so with that, House File 3513, um, and oh, and it's the first engrossment as amended, okay? House file 3513, the first engrossment as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. So thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Okay, um, now we have um, House file 58, Representative Elkins. And um, so Representative Elkins is not on our committee. So the chair will move that House file 58, the second, engrossment be laid over for possible inclusion in the house finance in the health finance bill and there are two amendments that i see here representative elkins um, 
So I assume that you would like to adopt the DE1 author's amendment first. And yes, we, what is your pleasure? We want to adopt the, the DE first, and then the A4 is uh, a strictly, strictly a technical amendment. Okay, all right, so um, let's adopt the DE1 and then we can discuss the bill in the uh, order in which the uh, author would like to have it discussed. So the DE1 is before us. So all in favor of adoption of the DE1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, the motion prevails and the DE1 is adopted. And then Representative Elkins, I have the A6 as the number for the amendment. Is that correct? Oh, you, you're correct. It's the A6, I'm, my, my mistake. Okay. So the A6 amendment is before us. And after we adopt this, I assume you'll explain to us uh, how this is all now different than the previous bill. So the A6 is before us. Um, any discussion? All in favor of adoption of the A6 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the A6 amendment is adopted. So Representative Elkins, please uh, go ahead and describe your bill. And members, we did hear this bill previously last year. So we might need just a bit of a refresher, a brief Brief, brief explanation and an explanation of what the changes are, Representative Elkins. Thank yes, you. thank you. Step so, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I need to make sure I get, here we go, share my screen. Okay, so if we recall from, from last year, uh, this bill has uh, two major um, provisions. So, uh, and the, uh, the first part of it re requires uh, manufacturers uh, to disclose their uh, um, their prices, and the the big change from last year to this one is that uh, originally the, the original version of the bill I had the drug companies being required to file their prices for the next year well in advance, and then having those those prices frozen for the duration of the year. And uh, over the uh, during over the course of the hearings last year, and over the study I did over the interim. Um, of, of the case law and speaking with legal experts uh, from organizations like the National Association of Self, Self, State Health Policy and NCSL, uh, clearly gained the understanding that the way that was originally in, in, was written was almost certainly illegal under federal law. So in, in this revision of the bill, uh, it simply re requires the drug companies to provide 90 days advance notice of any price increases uh, those price filings would be with MDH in the same format as required by the current Minnesota Drug Price Transparency Act, that's Kelly Morrison's bill from two years ago. So it would not change the, uh, the format of the filings, but it would require um, a great deal of additional data records to be, to be filed. And uh, this clearly would be illegal. California, and I now understand maybe Oregon, are already doing this. It has been challenged in the courts and has been upheld. So I'm confident that the way this part of the bill is written would withstand um, uh, legal scrutiny and it would provide the transparency that we're looking for in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, publish the prices of the, um, the, the drugs that uh, uh, patients are, are taking. So the um, second section then the, uh, are, are the things that affect the, um, the plans and the pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, with this one now, what I, I learned, I, I was able to take a much more careful look at, uh, you know, what, what, how is this actually working today? And so the bill uh, in this form now um, actually just is just codifying what is happening today. So uh, what I, I learned is that uh, uh, the, um, the plans and the PBMs are conduct their negotiations uh, regarding next year's prices with the manufacturers and that those negotiations continue through July, uh, at which time they, the, uh, the plans um, finalize their formularies and make updates to the, the formularies that they had filed earlier with Commerce at the beginning of, of August uh, so that they can get final approval of their plans in time for open enrollment. Um, so this, you know, codifies that practice. It, it allows the, the plans, the PBMs, the manufacturers to conduct all of their negotiations according to their schedule in time 
uh, for Commerce to be able to uh, um, you know, review the filings. And Commerce in, in the original fiscal note estimated that there would be no additional cost to them for this provision. So um, it then allows the, the, uh, the plans and DBMs to change their formularies pretty much any way they, they want with, on 60 days notice, uh, which gives them 30 days of time uh, after they receive the, uh, any price changes from the manufacturers to be able to re react to those price increases and adjust their formularies uh, accordingly. And I should note um, that uh, one of the things I learned as I was doing my research uh, is that uh, uh, the, the PBMs are building inflation protection into their contracts with the manufacturers. Uh, it's not a, you know, a complete lockdown of the pricing, uh, but it is uh, enough that uh, the, 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 uh, the plans and PBMs are able to uh, project their, their drug costs with a high degree of accuracy such that uh, uh, the uh, PBM industry and their report actually concluded that uh, the impact of, of, uh, uh, of these increases and in mid-year increases on existing drugs uh, would be immaterial in their words uh, to, the, uh, to the plans and the PBMs. So the main restriction um, that uh, where all, all of the attention is focused is, is the requirement that remains is, is that if a patient is already taking a drug uh, when the formulary is changed, they're basically grandfathered onto their existing drugs if it's, if it's working well. And, and this, is, this is a provision that is, is very important to uh, both doctors and patients, as you would see by you know, looking at the testimony that's been provided by the Medi Minnesota Medical Association. Um, it doesn't you know, prohibit a, a plan or a PBM for um, in incentivizing um, them a patient to switch to a new drug by putting it on a, a more favorable term on, on the formulary. But many, many patients, you know, choose their health plan during the open enrollment the previous year based on the drugs they're current, currently taking and are, are working for them. And I think that it's reasonable that those uh, patients should have an expectation uh, that if the drug was on the formulary when they signed up for the plan, that that, that, that contract should be honored through the end of, of, of that plan. So, um, you know, I, I get frustrated when I, I hear this bill characterized as a frozen formulary. Formularies aren't frozen. It's just requiring sufficient and, uh, uh, advance notice on the part of both the manufacturers and the plans and PBMs, uh, uh, you know, of impending changes so that, uh, that the patients can, can adjust and that the original uh, contract that the patient and the plan made during open enrollment is, is honored. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, I should also mention on the fiscal note, we we're waiting for a new fiscal note. So I'm happy we're just laying this over right now. But um, from the, uh, for the cost of it, the additional data processing by uh, the Department of Health, um, their original estimate is that they would, it would require $360,000 to uh, um, for implementation and then $135,000 on an ongoing basis. They are updating that figure right now. Uh, that will be in the new footnote. And of course, the, um, the most controversial part last year was uh, uh, a, a fiscal note that we received from MMD related to CGIP. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, th that estimated something like $25 million a year, but it was the basis for that was that um, the inaction of this law would uh, um, trip a, a provision in uh, CGIP's existing contract. And, and Re Representative Valkin, if I could just pause yeah. here. First of all, I don't, I don't think we need to go back okay. about that. But what I would ask you is to stop sharing your screen now. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Each other. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. I, I don't know if, you know, maybe if there are questions about what happened before we could go back to that, but I, I don't think that is in front of us now. So, okay. all right. So um, we do have a number of people who want to testify, I assume against your bill, but we'll find out. Um, and Representative Elkins, you don't have any testifiers that you brought today, am I right? I think most of the, the, the people who are in favor of the bill have submitted uh, letters instead of testimony. Okay, very good. So we will we will note that. Okay, very good. Thank you. So first on the list, I have Michelle Mack. Welcome to the committee. 
Good afternoon, Chair Liebling and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Mack and I am a senior director at PCMA, which is the National Trade Association for the Pharmacy Benefit Managers. Uh, I, we appreciate the opportunity to testify in House File 58 and we have submitted written testimony for the record, but I just wanted to bring up a few main points uh, from our letter and then also address some of the issues um, that Representative Elkins um, presented to us previously. Um, I just wanted to note that um, we, we negotiate the drugs that go on the formulary in July in that time frame. That is correct. However, the prices change all the time. Drugs are a commodity. In addition, we're negotiating those contracts all the time. And those contracts are several year contracts as well. Um, so, you know, we, we do finalize them and, and submit it to the Department of Commerce by August 1st, um, but the, 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 the idea of the price is set in July for the next year and a half, essentially, uh, I, I unfortunately disagree with. Um, the second item that I wanted to bring up was the price inflation. Um, that is, in, is noted in the Milliman report that um, I did submit along with my written testimony. Um, the Milliman report indicates when they talked about there was no price increase or there was no reflection of that, they talked about mid-year formularies. That, that is a 15-page document where we included lots of other items that do co increase cost. And the Milliman report said that it would increase costs in Minnesota by $75 million over five years. Um, and, you know, I would say that the analysis from the states CGIP, um, substantiates that. Um, the other item that I just wanted to bring up is we do have appeals processes for the health plans and that the health plans and PBMs that have in place to access any sort of a non formulary drug. So the health plan and the PBM works with the patient and his or her provider to provide access to these non-formulary drugs where it's medically necessary and or likely to create the best clinical outcome. And we believe our, our appeals processes are fair and responsive. And in addition, we, we think that House File 58, while there are possibilities for us to make changes, it was noted in the uh, report that was done by the Department of Commerce that health plans can't make price-based formulary changes. And there, but there is an exemption for health plans operating as MCOs that administer medical assistance in Minnesota care, as well as county-based purchasing plans. And those, uh, there is an allowance for them to make formulary changes each calendar year. Um, the final thing that I will say is that we're currently reviewing the language in the A6 amendment, but in closing, we believe that House File 58 will raise prescription drug costs as it removes important tools that PBMs use to deliver high quality services. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, Christina Moorhead, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Christina Moorhead and I'm a Deputy Vice President of State Policy for the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma. We represent the country's leading innovative biopharmaceutical research companies. Uh, so today we are respectfully opposing House File 58, which amends the 2020 Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act to require drug manufacturers to report pricing information for prescription medicines with a wholesale acquisition cost or WAC of $100 or more for a 30-day supply, and also to give the insurance commissioner 90 days notice prior to increasing the WAC of a prescription medicine in certain circumstances. So as you know, in 2020, the Minnesota legislature passed the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act, which requires drug manufacturers to report specific information when the price of a medicine increases by a certain percentage over a period of time. Pharma has worked in good faith with the Minnesota Department of Health over the past year to implement this act. But the final user guide became available and the portal for report submission went live exactly just one month ago. So initial drug manufacturer reports were not due until this month, and we would expect that information based on this report would be available publicly later this year. So we believe that House File 58 places additional reporting requirements on drug manufacturers before the current reporting requirements have been evaluated and assessed. So we would urge you to pause any additional reporting mandates on drug manufacturers until these current reporting requirements have been fully implemented and assessed by the legislature and others. 
We also have concerns with the 90 day notification requirement for a manufacturer to change the whack of a prescription drug. Advanced notification has been shown to create gray markets where secondary distributors enter the pharmaceutical supply chain, stockpiling medicines and reselling them to each other before they're ultimately sold to hospitals or other healthcare facilities. Gray markets create shortages and introduce avenues where counterfeit medicines may enter the market, threatening patient safety and driving up prescription drug prices. We have challenged the constitution, constitutionality of laws requiring advanced notification. Uh, Representative Elkins um, spoke of one in California, in both California and Oregon, on a number of grounds, including under the First Amendment and the Dormant Commerce Clause. This litigation is actually still pending on appeal um, in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. So if these laws were to be invalidated, a similar analysis would apply um, to the proposed legislation as well. So in summary, while we believe that House File 58 is well intended, it doesn't address the issue of what a patient pays for a prescription medicine, and it does not do anything to lower the cost of prescription medicines um, for patients in Minnesota. I thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moorhead. Uh, next, we have Brett, Brett Michelin, welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members and Representative Elkins. Uh, Brett Michelin with the Association for Accessible Medicines, AAM, represents the generic and biosimilar manufacturers. And I'm going to uh, do my best to be brief here and cut my testimony to not reiterate some of, of what was previously mentioned. Uh, we do have two additional concerns I would like to bring up, though. And I think hopefully the first is viewed as a friendly amendment uh, and um, and something that I think was just left out in drafting, uh, as we've seen it around the country actually in, in very similar language. And that is in Article 3 subdivision, I'm sorry, Article 2 subdivision 3 of the bill, having to do with the formulary changes. Uh, in the section that says uh, what drugs could be brought into uh, the bill, the, it mentions generic drugs and interchangeable bio, biologics. It leaves out biosimilars. As we know, biosimilars are truly what is driving down the cost of healthcare. In fact, they're usually introduced to the market of 45% of the reference product. And when competition through biosimilars comes to market, we have seen on average, the price of biologic drugs dropping by 25%. Uh, so we would strongly suggest that you add biosimilars into that section because this is dealing with formularies, not therapeutic substitution. So just bringing in the interchangeables really should have no effect uh, other than saving patients money. The other provision I'd like to bring up real quickly is in the additional transparency uh, report or pricing report. One of the provisions in there uh, that, that does cause us great concern is that uh, manufacturers would have to report the WAC price for all drugs over $100, as, as the author had mentioned. The concern, especially on the generic side of this, is in, say, take one instance where a one manufacturer may have the generic drug at a very high price, way over $100. The patient goes onto the state website where, the, where this is required to be posted. They look up their drug and they see the potential cost significantly high. What they won't see is all of the other generic manufacturers that are at a greatly reduced cost. That information is not necessarily going to be available. It's not, it's not required to be reported, nor should it be, because the average price that a patient pays out of pocket is about $6 for a generic drug. So some of the, the way that the, the WAC reporting is, is being required to, to be produced in this bill, produced on a website by the state, could actually lead to patient harm when they're looking at uh, drugs on the generic side that are not gonna be nearly as expensive because we our WAC prices really are not reflected in what is charged to the patient and the out-of-pocket costs that come to them. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Michelin. Seems like that could be fixed with an asterisk on the website. Um, so members, any discussion? Um, questions or discussion? Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a first quick question for the author, Representative Elkins, thanks for bringing the bill forward. I just wanted to clarify the contract issue about the grandfathered uh, prescriptions that there would be no change on the, for the, uh, the people who have 
signed up for a specific drug in a specific year. And I think uh, the, the, the slide you showed said that there would be no change. They would be able to keep their meds and keep, would the, would the price be kept at the same price for the full year or would the price go up with the 60 day notice and then they would just keep that med until the end of the plan. Is that what I understood? Representative um, Elkins. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Bierman, the intention is that, uh, uh, you know, if you're on a, a um, say a particular form of, of insulin, and this is probably a, a good example because, uh, um, you know, um, frequently different kinds of insulin are, are treated as interchangeable, but different patients react differently to different forms of, of the drug. Uh, so if, you're, um, if your doctor has you on a particular form of insulin and it's working well for you, you should be able to stay on that drug at the same price through the end of the plan. Okay, so Representative thank, Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, so just to follow up, Representative Elkins, so the next year, they, they would just have to re, uh, or re pick a plan that would have that same drug in it. They couldn't stay with the same drug. It doesn't continue no. in the next year, even though- If they during open Representative enrollment- Representative Elkins. The, yes, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Bierman. Yes, it, 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 during open enrollment for the next plan year, you could shop for a health plan in which the, the, the version of insulin that works best for you was covered. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. May I ask one more question? For uh, Ms. Mack. Uh, this, Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, Ms. Mack, my question is uh, you stated in your testimony that you were um, concerned that House File 58 will increase the, the cost of pharmaceuticals. So my question is if we do not, if we do, um, if we do not uh, pass this legislation, will pharmaceuticals not rise in price? Representative, or I'm sorry, Ms. Mack. Uh, Chair Levine, Chair Liebling, Representative Bierman. I mean, uh, you know, prices rise all the, 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 the cost of pharmaceuticals rise all the time. Unfortunately, um, they, they will probably, I mean, the cost will be more expensive um, at the end of the day if this does pass. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mack, right. for answering the question right. so straightforwardly. And just a, a follow on to that then. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify, another item you spoke about that prices do change all the time, but I understood that you said contracts are negotiated for years at a time. Did I misunderstand that or, or do you negotiate contracts for years at a time with plans? Ms. Mack? Shirley Lane, Representative Bierman, our, our contracts, our, our negotiations happen usually um, the, 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 essentially when we negotiate with the manufacturers, these are for rebates and they are a multi-year contract. Um, I, you know, I, you have to remember though that there are changes to those contracts all the time as well. So, I mean, even though it's, it's a contract that's in place at, you know, in July, there's changes all the time. Um, Madam Chair, will All you right. indulge me one more question? Right. Representative Bierman, we have two other members with their hands Sorry. up, but go ahead. Okay, this is actually for um, Mr. Michelin. He spoke about the WAC, and I wondered if you could define WAC for the committee and then answer whether the WAC, where does the United States cost of pharmaceuticals rate on that calculation? Mr. Michelin. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, the WAC is the wholesale acquisition cost. And that is a, on the generic side, that is a price that is set by the, uh, by the manufacturer. However, it, it is almost always negotiated down. It's, it's think of it as a list price of a car. Nobody pays the list price of the car. Nobody pays the WAC price of a generic drug. Um, and you, when you have multiple manufacturers making the exact same drug, they can have wildly different whack prices. So you can have a, a, a we've used examples in the past where you, literally with a, one manufacturer with a whack price of a dollar and another manufacturer with a whack price of several hundred dollars, perhaps it's because they're no longer in the market, no longer making that drug. So the whack price, they'll raise it to s signal the market they're no longer doing it. And as far as the costs, uh, and if I understand the second part of your question, where do the costs fall 
in other places. If you're, I, I think you're referring to like international reference pricing, um, perhaps. Um, generic drugs are significantly less expensive in, in the United States than they are in Canada. That's why we've never opposed the importation bills on, on that front. Um, they're frankly, they're, they're lower cost here than they are up, up uh, to our neighbors in the north. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Bierman. So uh, Bonner and then Backer, Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you. You know, it's really unfortunate that states across the country have really been put in this position where we are practically begging for information on transparency. Um, and, you know, the best legislation is no legislation, but quite frankly, because of some of the abuses that we've seen, I think legislatures have had to respond to really work for consumers and the citizens of their state. Um, two really quick points I want to add to that. I know there was some conversation about um, groups where you can apply for a exception process. I will tell you in the early part of my career, I worked for a company and did exactly that. And they are trained to deny. I'm just gonna be really blunt. They are trained to deny those requests. So in case anybody was unclear about that. And the other piece of that is when we talk about grandfathering in drugs, you're talking about an insulin that's working for a patient. When, it do, when we have to transfer them to another alternative that may not work with their body chemistry, we're talking an average hospital stay of six to $8,000. Are we actually suggesting that the way to reduce the price of prescription drugs and healthcare is to put people in the hospital because we will not allow them to have the drug that suits their body and that keeps them alive? If that is what we are suggesting here, we are in dire trouble. And so with that, I'm just gonna leave it there, but I think I appreciate the bill representative Elkins, as you know, I support it and I will be voting yes today. Thank you very much, Representative Bonner. Representative Backer. Yeah, I'll just ask one question because of the time. Um, you know, what will, and this goes to the author, I, I'm assuming, what will this bill accomplish for consumers that the trans, that the bills that we passed last year about transparency, you know, we did some last year and now we're looking at possibly doing this one. Why do we need both? Thank you. Uh, Representative Elkins. Sure. Uh, happy to answer that. I, I think th I, this is a logical follow on to the, to the bill that we passed uh, two years ago. Uh, someone else characterized it to me the other day. Uh, it was like, Elkins, you're just peeling away the onion one layer at a time. Uh, there will be uh, additional legislation after this one has been digested as well. Uh, as several testifiers have noted, for example, uh, people don't pay the wholesale acquisition cost. It's a reference price. But everything in this business is tied to the wholesale acquisition cost as a reference price. The discounts, the rebates, the commissions, everything is tied to the wholesale acquisition cost as a reference price. And it's, important, it's an important data point for us as policymakers. And I think the public deserves to know, for example, so my wife is taking uh, Dupixent, which you see advertised on TV every, uh, three times a night uh, for her uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, uh, people deserve to know when they see those commercials every night that that drug costs $32,000 a year. So a, a new uh, a, a patented drug was coming onto the market, a, a cream, which is an alternative. And I, we saw that that was approved. And I got all excited and I looked it up and looked up its wholesale acquisition cost. This cream, the new cream cost $80,000 a year. Yeah. Okay, um, Representative Elkins, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, but um, thank you very, very much. And I um, just want to bring this back and um, uh, before we close, I also want to just say a couple of things here, and that is that it's interesting to me always to hear uh, folks say, uh, you know, we don't like this bill because it doesn't do X and it doesn't do Y, but this bill does a lot. It does a lot, and what it does, one of the big things it does is give consumers the benefit of their bargain. And we're hearing about, oh, how the PBMs contract and things change and their contracts change. What about the consumer? The consumer is spending a lot of money to buy a product based on a promise of getting a certain drug at a certain cost level. And then when they are locked into their plan, lo and behold, it gets yanked out from under them, the benefit of the thing they think they purchased. It just 
seems to me that the industry people, this bill will never be good enough for them because they just basically want nothing. This is about Minnesota consumers, and I really appreciate the work that Representative Elkins has done on this. He's worked and worked and worked to try to make this bill something that can go forward. And I think we all owe him a lot. I also want to just mention, uh, Mr. Michelin talked about biosimilars. Well, Representative Schultz has a bill on that. We're hearing it at our next hearing. So we're working on many fronts here. One bill doesn't have to do it all. So uh, with that, Representative Elkins, did you want to just have a real quick final word before we lay the bill over? Yeah, just a real final one. I mean, I'd just like to you know, respond briefly to uh, some of Ms. Matt's comments, but I, I, I would draw your attention to the report. Um, that uh, the PCMA uh, attached to our, our documents. It is a very good report, uh, but you know when we're talking in the aggregate about you know number of dollars, there's a huge amount of money here, and so you know 75 million dollars sounds like a, a lot of money, but if you look at the summary of their report uh, on page three, which I recommend you do, a summary of findings, it says uh, assuming drug prescription drug expenditures represent percent total medical 20 percent of total medical spending this represents a 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 increase in aggregate payer medical and prescription got drug costs and that's for an actual uh formulary freeze which this bill is not uh and yeah. elsewhere I, she also commented that uh about, about uh, price increases there's a section in the report on page eight that i would draw everyone's attention to entitled medications experiencing mid-year price increases where it says okay representative elkins we do need okay. to wrap it up here because we're out of time so thank you very much for the bill thank you everyone for your testimony and house file 58 the second engrossment as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill and with that members we will be meeting on friday prepare for a long meeting and with that we are adjourned